Welcome to the Yoga Therapy Hour. Today, we have a very special guest named Maya Siemens, and I think you're going to be so inspired by her story of how she has dealt with having ADHD since about the early teens and how that corresponded to her getting her first menstrual cycle and how many years of suffering that she went through before she learned through yoga, yoga therapy, and Ayurveda, that there's actually a connection between ADHD and the menstrual cycle. So for those of you who don't know, usually ADHD has many different symptoms. And it could be that you have lack of focus, although sometimes ADHD has hyper-focus too, meaning the things that ADHD people like, they're really absorbed in, but the things they're not so crazy about, they have a very hard time paying attention to those things. So it could be something to do with focus. It could be with impulsivity, interrupting people when they're speaking or just getting so excited about the thing that they're about to do that they jump in rather impulsively. And in some cases, it could involve some hyperactivity. So this is what we mean by ADHD, also called attention deficit disorder. And it's really interesting to hear Maya's story of how she was diagnosed with ADHD right at the time that she also got her first menstrual cycle. And I'm not going to tell her story, have you listened to the podcast for that. But I think this episode even goes beyond ADHD. For those of you who are thinking, but I don't have ADHD. Yes, but if you've had a menstrual cycle, this episode is going to be so good for you to understand that with or without ADHD, different parts of your cycle, by that I mean the bleeding cycle, the 7 to 10 to 12 days after you're done bleeding, before ovulation, then ovulation, then post-ovulation, and preparing for the next bleed. We need different practices, different herbs, different foods at each time in that cycle. And so whether you have ADHD or not, this episode could be super, super helpful. And even those women who are in perimenopause and menopause, I think you can also benefit because going into perimenopause and menopause is very similar to what we felt that 10, 12 days before we bleed or before the menstrual cycle starts again. So if you had a hard time during your menstrual cycle, right before the bleeding, you're probably going to have a hard time during perimenopause or menopause. And I also want to say this episode is for men. Men, you have all the same cycles as women. You just don't have the bleeding to let you know what's going on. So whether you love a woman and you want to learn more about this, or whether you are ready to understand that you too have this exact same cycle going on in your body as a man, that's something that's very important for you to understand. So thank you so much for listening today. I think you're really going to enjoy this episode with Maya and let's go. Let's go meet her. Welcome to the Yoga Therapy Hour podcast. We're so happy that you're on this journey with us, and we'd like to invite you to a few other activities. Number one, we have a Monday night yoga therapy clinic, and each month we choose a different topic. It's a deep time together, both professionally and personally, and we do offer CE units. So come join us on Monday nights, if you will. We'll see you there, and until then, let's get into our podcast. Welcome, Maya. It's so nice to have you here this morning. Hi, Amy. So excited to be here with you. So, Maya, today we are talking about a topic that I just wish all women knew about. And, you know, today we're talking about ADHD and the menstrual cycle and how yoga therapy and Ayurveda can support women who have ADHD. But I think what we're talking about today is actually applicable to all women who have had a menstrual cycle. And I wish I had had this information when I was younger. Yeah, thanks for saying that, Amy. I do think in some ways there's almost a level of grief to deal with, to think back 
to me as a younger person and the lack of information that I had. So it's sad, but it's also, it kind of like, it's my why. It kind of empowers me to want to do this work and spread this information. Are you willing to tell us a little bit about your story so that we can kind of understand that why better? Yeah. So it's interesting looking back, I was diagnosed with ADHD the same year I got my first period. Yeah. So at that time, there was no correlation. I didn't have a correlation, but I was treated for ADHD and in the best way they knew how back then, which was through kind of providing learning accommodation. So extended time on tests and extra support with organization and medication. So I was medicated on Adderall for most of my life from the time I started my first menstrual cycle until my mid-20s. I chose to come off the medication once I had established a really kind of strong foundational yoga practice with the support of a yoga therapist. And after having worked for a few months with an Ayurvedic practitioner, I felt I had enough support in my life to go off the medication and... I've been off the medication and managing my symptoms with yoga therapy and Ayurveda. And through that have found that my symptoms shift throughout the month. And so I've learned that tracking my cycle, I've learned about the way that my cycle impacts my symptoms of ADHD. So understanding that connection to my cycle has been a huge part of how I manage my ADHD. Well, before we jump into the specifics about maybe the different phases of the cycle and what you might do to support yourself and others during that time, can we first go back to when you made that decision to get off this medication that you'd been on since childhood? Like, was that a hard transition or was it not so bad? Because I think a lot of people have a lot of fear around that. I imagine you did that with the guidance of some medical professionals. Definitely. Yeah, I didn't mention that, but I was also working with the licensed therapist and a psychologist Mm -hmm. at that time. You know, they were in the loop and they were part of the team as well. But I think the yoga sutras say this too, right? Like do a practice every day. And then when you're ready, the behaviors that you don't want or the things you don't want will fall away naturally. And that's how I did it. I didn't just sort of like deprive myself of it when I needed it because I did need it for a long time and it was very helpful. But because I had this daily yoga practice and this way of regulating and all of this information about how my body and mind work through studying with you, through studying yoga therapy and having my own experience with it, I felt like I had enough support in my life and I felt confident that it was the right time. So it really felt in line with my truth. And I didn't just recklessly make this choice. It was pretty thoughtful. And like I said, at that time, I really had a team of support behind me, which was super important. Beautiful. All right. So let's jump right into the meat of this discussion, which is there are different phases of a woman's menstrual cycle. And we actually need to do self-care regimens for the different phases. So do you want to start us off talking about that? Yeah. So I think we all know there's a period of three to seven days where a person who menstruates is bleeding. So there's the period And then after the period is the follicular phase. And during that phase, it's sort of the building phase. So if we think of it according to yoga therapy and Ayurveda, this is the kapha. This is the building. This is estrogen and progesterone and serotonin. They're on the rise. And so for folks who menstruate and have ADHD, it's a bit easier to manage symptoms during this follicular phase because estrogen is so connected to dopamine And the way that dopamine is released and the availability of dopamine and, you know, ADHD has to do with a lack of dopamine. So we sort of have the chemistry in the brain in those first two weeks during the follicular phase that make it a bit easier for us to manage the ADHD. And then ovulation happens and that's sort of the peak of our energy. And then the last part of the cycle is the luteal phase. And that's when estrogen and progesterone and serotonin begin to drop. And so for those of us with a menstrual cycle and ADHD, that last part of the cycle can be extra debilitating because we're already sort of lacking dopamine and then our brain chemistry changes so much throughout the cycle. So the availability of dopamine goes down and so our ADHD symptoms rise. And so my hope is that this information is empowering for folks because the more we anticipate what's coming, the more we can curate ourselves and our support systems to kind of meet us where we are and throughout the different times of the cycle. You know, when I hear you speaking of this, I think what 
you know, growing up as a woman, I was just aware of like, it's coming in a few days. I don't feel so great. Oh, this is such a pain to be bleeding. And then after that, as you say, I always felt good for a couple of weeks. It was like, oh, life is good. But I don't think we really think about the complex chemistry that's happening inside of us in which things are going up and down. And if you don't have enough estrogen, that's going to lead to, you know, less dopamine, like all these things that you're saying that the audience might actually have to back up the tape and kind of take some notes and like, oh, that's why I feel better in that phase right after I'm bleeding, but I don't feel so well in the seven to 10 days leading up to bleeding again. Exactly. It sounds to me like that's even worsened when you have ADHD and could even lead to something like PMDD, which I know you and I have talked about, and I'll just quickly kind of define what PMDD is. It's premenstrual dysphoric disorder, and it's kind of like PMS on steroids. You might have terrible bloating and headaches and breast tenderness in the weeks before your period, but here's the kicker. It also causes really high anxiety, depression, mood changes, and can even make people feel suicidal those couple of weeks leading up to the bleeding again. Nobody's talking about this. And you know, the data shows that 46% of folks who menstruate and have ADHD also have PMDD. And my understanding is that the numbers are even higher for folks with autism. So can we stop there? for I am just learning about this how closely connected these neurodiverse pathologies in our minds and bodies and nervous systems, how affected and connected they are to the menstrual cycle. And it's just amazing. Can you imagine so many people out there with autism or what we call ADHD, where you have autism and ADHD, having no clue about what you're talking about today? It's frightening. Yeah. And, you know, I work with these people every day. Mm -hmm. I'm working in an intensive outpatient program. And sometimes I facilitate groups for trauma. And just yesterday I had a group, everyone in the group menstruated. And we got into this discussion because a few folks were on their periods and were really experiencing more intensified depression and anxiety than usual. And we got into this information and there were so many light bulb moments because so many folks in these rooms have... PMDD, they have fibroids, they have endometriosis, they have struggles with their period pain. So I see it in my work. Yeah. So do you mind if we go through each of the phases and talk about how we might best be supported during each phase? Sure. That would be great. All right. So how about, why don't we start with day one when we're actually bleeding What are some of the things that we can do to support our nervous system, our mind, our body, our spirit? I think some of this work is deeper because what we need to do a lot of the time is to rest. Mm. And so permission to rest is a lot deeper than just resting because I think a lot of us have ideas about rest that that makes me lazy or I'm not being productive. So there's frustration. There's a lot of resistance to rest in our culture because of this dominant narrative that is so deeply ingrained in so many of us that associates rest with being lazy or not good enough. So we have to work through our resistance to rest, but I would say permission to rest, feeling like it's your right to rest during that time. And once we get there, I mean, this time is ruled by Vata. We are sort of more closely connected to spirit during this time. So if you're open to it, this part of the cycle can be a beautiful time to really lean into rest, to kind of lean into practices that support us in connecting, whether that's meditation or yoga nidra or oiling the body, taking a bath, like really nurturing practices. But I think that's harder than it sounds. It is so much harder. It's a revolutionary act, right? To say, I deserve rest. I'm going to take rest. I'm not going to feel guilty about it. It's really amazing. So what about as we move into that phase after the bleeding stops, but before ovulation begins? Yeah. So that's the building, you know, estrogen begins to build as soon as the period comes. Mm -hmm. So for folks with PMDD, there actually can be some relief that starts immediately as the period begins because that's when the estrogen begins to build up again. 
So in the days and the days following the period, that's when we're building. That's when we're thinking about our schedule. Like that's when we can kind of take on a little bit more, maybe our workouts, we can do a little bit more. We can push our bodies a little bit more. Our digestion is stronger at that time. So we might get away with not eating super strict or there's more room for us to just build. So I would say exercise and tasks that require a lot of energy. It's great to kind of get into that during that building phase. Absolutely. All right. So ovulation, like halfway through the cycle, what do you think? Yeah, that's kind of the peak, you know, plan social events, be around people. If you're in partnership, it's great to like plan dates or be social and it can be a fun time. I think that's when a lot of us, we kind of feel our best. So yeah. Yeah, That's interesting. Biologically, I bet our biology is telling us to go out there and be social and connect. And how else would the human species survive if we weren't feeling really good and happy and juicy and beautiful around the time? of ovulation. Though I think, you know, there are some women that ovulation can be very painful. There are things like that. So, all right. So then let's get into ovulation has happened. There has not been a pregnancy occurred. And now to me, it feels like everything just kind of dumps at that point. Like, okay, all the hormones I had supporting me for the last two weeks are now gone. Mm -hmm. (laughs) What do you think? What, what happens here? Yeah. So we're working with limited resources. So we really want to manage our stress during those last two weeks. Mm -hmm. Our digestion's a little bit weaker. So eating at regular times, eating foods that are easy for our, our bodies to digest. And if you are taking herbs, you know, the last two weeks, I think that that's sort of the time to get your herbal regimen together and really prioritize your rest and do more gentle exercises or yoga practices. It's kind of a time to think about managing your resources if that kind of metaphor works Mm -hmm. for people, but you have limited resources. So we just need to be better at managing it during the last two weeks of the cycle. A little more strict with our schedules, making sure we get enough sleep, enough water. I found water really, really connected to this whole thing, especially in the second part of the cycle. Totally. And so you mentioned herbs. Tell us a little bit about herbs, because I think obviously yoga therapy doesn't deal with herbs, but you're also an Ayurvedic practitioner. You know, it's super individualized. And I think when we talk about ADHD, it's a cluster of symptoms, but the root cause for all of us is going to be different. With periods, you know, difficult periods can have a range of symptoms. And so this is where it becomes really personalized. If there's stagnation, maybe, you know, this isn't an herb, but castor packs are a really beautiful practice to support with stagnation. And there are herbs that we can work with for stagnation. Meaning castor packs on the outside of your skin, Mm -hmm. sitting on your lower abdomen. Yeah. And what does that do, Maya? It removes stagnation. It helps blood flow. Mm -hmm. So for those of us with lighter periods or painful periods, Dr. Claudia Welsh says, wherever there's pain, there's stagnation. Mm -hmm. So that can be a really beautiful practice, not recommended to do while you're bleeding, but in the weeks leading up to it. You know, that even goes towards like polycystic ovaries or endometriosis or, you know, some of those other things can be quite painful also. Definitely. Definitely. I hesitate to just recommend general herbs. I think it really should be personalized. So seeing, Mm -hmm. you know, an Ayurvedic practitioner or an Ayurvedic doctor, but yet there's ways that we can really personalize it. And we look at the qualities of the period. So we look at whether it's light or heavy or painful. We look at the color of the bleeding, whether there's clots, how regular it is. Some folks bleed during ovulation. So we look at all of these things and then we pull in the herbs and the practices that will be best for the individual. I love that you're saying that because you've given some kind of general guidelines for all of us during the different cycles, but to really say that the herbs need to be specific to the person. I think the yoga practice needs to be specific to the person, maybe even the meditation practices specific and, and even changing at different times of the month, right? That Absolutely. practice during the first two weeks might be more vigorous and more energetic. And maybe in the last two weeks, it is more restorative, more gentle, more yoga nidra type things. Absolutely. 
Yeah. And so a person with an ADHD diagnosis and a PCOS diagnosis, again, the root causes of those things could be totally different. So the, the treatment plan would look totally different. Yeah. I think the history of women's health has not been studied. I mean, I hate to say it. I don't mean to be a negative Nelly, but basically all the peer reviewed journals and studies and all the evidence-based medicine, which of course we like, but at the same time, I don't like, because it's a bunch of old white guys that have been in charge of this since the beginning of time. And it really doesn't represent women. It doesn't represent people of color. It doesn't represent people of different socioeconomic status. And so, you know, on one hand, yes, we want to see the research, but on the other hand, they're not doing research on us. Absolutely. Yeah, and again, I think that there's a level of grief with that and maybe anger that comes with that, that we have to acknowledge and honor because for a lot of us, it takes us really getting to a point of pain and desperation that lead us to finding yoga and Ayurveda. And it shouldn't be like that. And it just makes me so sad because someone like you should be in every junior high school in the nation, in the world, telling women here's what you can do to support yourself. Here's what's happening inside your body. It doesn't have to be this painful. You don't have to feel suicidal ideations. How sad is it that we're not teaching our young women these things at an age where they can use it? Like I didn't learn about it until my forties. Right. Go ahead. It can be really beautiful to embrace the cycle and to live in, you know, rhythm and connection to your cycle. I think that's Part of my message too is that it doesn't have to be painful. It doesn't have to be horrible every month that there actually can be a beauty in really leaning into our rhythms and embracing our cycle. And I want to add, I know this is strange for people to think about, but young men also have a cycle. They just don't bleed. So the men are going through this also, and they have no clue. And women who are postmenopausal, like myself, We still have those cycles, even though we're not bleeding. It may not be the highs and lows that we used to experience. Thank God. (laughs) I'm so done with that. But we still have it. I've still felt exhausted for the last seven to 10 days. And I know that this is why I know I'm going through this 28 day cycle, even though there's no bleeding. So I think it really is pertinent to young men, young women, women who have gone through menopause and even men who've gone through andropause. So it's really relevant to all of us. Absolutely. We can't balance our hormones if we're chronically stressed. Did you know that the optimal state trains yoga therapists? This is something that takes about two years, although some people take up to six years. It really depends on your schedule. And we train you in how to create nervous system regulation, how to help one's mind come into what we call sattva, a place of balance or peace. And during our program, we not only bring that to you personally, but we teach you how to be a professional and bring that to other people. So if you're interested in mental health in nervous system regulation, we would love to help you learn how to become a yoga therapist. You can add it to your skill set if you're a PT or an OT or a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a doctor or a mom or a best friend. It doesn't really matter. But the point is we can help you up level your skill set in nervous system regulation and mental balance to the next level. And we'd love to have you join us at our yoga therapy program. You can come to www.amywheeler.com or www.theoptimalstate.com. All right. We hope you'll come and get more information. Yeah, that's right. And so I think as we enter different later life cycles, like perimenopause or menopause, like you're talking about, we have to get better at managing our stress because almost like those last two weeks of the menstrual cycle, that sort of can represent perimenopause. We have less estrogen. We have less progesterone. And so we have to get better at managing stress because we have less resources as, as we reach perimenopause. Yeah. And menopause. That's so true. Yeah. You start to feel like you did during those last two weeks, you start to feel like that most of the time, sadly. 
I remember when I was going through perimenopause, I literally for three years couldn't put a sentence together. I was like, do I have early onset Alzheimer's disease? Cause I can't think or speak anymore. It was horrible trying to work in that state. And the hot flashes were so, so intense, just horrible. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, a lot of folks with a menstrual cycle who are entering into perimenopause, they're getting diagnosed with ADHD for the first time. Oh, wow. Say more about that. And they truly have ADHD. Mm -hmm. Because just like in those first two weeks of the menstrual cycle, when estrogen's on the rise and progesterone's on the rise, serotonin's on the rise, it's easier to manage symptoms of ADHD. Mm. So for the first half of life up to until we're 35, for a lot of folks who menstruate, it's easier to manage the symptoms. But as soon as the estrogen begins to drop after 35 and the progesterone begins to drop, less access to dopamine in the brain, all of a sudden these ADHD symptoms are coming out of nowhere. And so this is like a whole phenomenon that- I'm you know, seeing it on TikTok. <laughs> so many women, but I don't think the women that I'm seeing know this. They just know that They got diagnosed with ADHD late in life. They don't understand how they went this long without understanding it. They don't understand that it's connected to their hormones. And basically they probably were experiencing this two, two weeks a month, but then it bounced back and it was like, okay, maybe I'm not, you know, maybe it's not so bad. So let's talk a little bit more about ADHD and mental health specifically You know, I see that you know how to support people at the different phases of their cycle, but from a holistic perspective, isn't there something to be said just for lifestyle medicine, lifestyle maintenance, that in adopting a supportive, nourishing lifestyle, it's just going to bring all boats up, you know, the, the tide raises. So tell us about that, about this holistic perspective of working with ADHD, which affects the menstrual cycle too. I mentioned this and I'll say it again, because I think it's really important. We can't balance our hormones if we're chronically stressed. Mm. So when we're in fight or flight, as you know, Amy, the body gets flooded with cortisol. Right. And actually progesterone can shift and turn into cortisol, but cortisol can't shift and turn into progesterone. So our body is always going to prioritize survival And so what that means is that if we're stressed out, this cortisol floods our system. It goes out into the biceps and the triceps and, you know, blood is pumped to the heart, but we're just saturated. The body saturated in cortisol. Dr. Claudia Welsh talks about this bucket theory. So if there's a hole in the bucket, so if we're chronically stressed, there's a hole in the bucket. Our hormones are out of balance because all of our hormones are being moved to just help us to survive. We have to kind of close that hole in the bucket before we even think about balancing our hormones or managing symptoms like ADHD. So the lifestyle is really important. It's just the stakes are higher, I think, for those of us with ADHD. We have less wiggle room. So the lifestyle stuff is super important because it supports us in managing our stress. So when the cortisol floods the system, when we're in fight or flight, that has to come from somewhere. And where does it come from? The parts that we don't need for survival. So digestion, reproduction. So all that energy that is being put out to help us survive, to help us run away, to move out to our biceps and our triceps so that we can run, blood pumping to the heart, all of that energy comes from somewhere and it comes from reproduction and digestion. And so in order to support the whole system and doing what it needs to do, we have to close that hole in the bucket. We have to manage our stress so that our reproductive system can work well and our digestive system can work well. You know, what's coming to mind, a lot of the women that I work with, similarly, they've been leading a life just full of stress response for decades and they've gotten away with it and put that in air quotes. And now it's come to a time where it's not working for them anymore and it's really affecting their mental health. But that's not what they're worried about. They're worried about the weight gain. So they come and they say, I need to lose weight. I've done everything. I'm exercising. I'm eating well, blah, blah, blah. And they can't lose weight. And it's because of the cortisol. And most of them aren't as concerned about the mental health. They just want to look a certain way. But I tried to explain to them, and I'm sure you've worked with clients too, that look, your weight, your mental health, and your cortisol are all connected. 
So let's really seriously think about trying a new lifestyle, which is hard because they're not as productive. They can't get as much done. They can't be running 14 hours a day. All the things that we as women take on to make our lives work of necessity or sometimes ego, you know, wanting to be that woman for everyone in the family. And it just stops working. We can't keep doing that as we get closer to perimenopause. And, you know, we'll blame it on the perimenopause or the menopause, but really the cause is exactly what you're saying. We have been living a stressful life for too long. Yeah. So the healing becomes about honoring the pace of the body for someone like you just described that can feel like a full death. Yes. That is so hard for women to comprehend. They want to keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's belief systems behind this. That's why this work is so much deeper than just prescribing you herbs and prescribing you a rest practice and prescribing you a yoga practice. Like we really have to sort of get deep into the belief system about why you are overexerting yourself and pushing yourself beyond your capacity and holding it together for everybody else in your life and why it's so uncomfortable to slow down and just sort of honor your own limits. There's an underlying belief system that's driving that, that we have to explore in order to really transform, I believe. Yeah. And it's not to shame any of us, right? It's to say, wow, girl, you had it hard. Maybe you lived through poverty. Maybe you lived through abuse. Maybe life handed you lemons and you made lemonade. You did it. You did the best you could, but we can't continue this, this survival thing that you've got going on. Yeah. And, you know, I've been taking Dr. Claudia Welsh's hormone course, which is why I keep Mm -hmm. referring to her because she's sort of fresh in my mind. But one of the you could say like the medicine that she invites us to think about for balancing our hormones is look at your life and stop doing one thing you hate every day. Take something out of your life that you hate because that's stressful, right? Like again, that's sort of treating the cortisol, but doing things we hate, doing things that are not in alignment with our truth is stressful for the system. Yeah. So maybe we can all sort of do (laughs) it. It's so (laughs) hard of us. We think we have to do those things. We think there's no other choice. Our perception is, well, I'm stuck here, so I have to do this. And there's a lot of wiggle room around that, depending on what we're willing to give up. (laughs) Right. But it's so interesting because, again, we think that it's like, okay, just give me the perfect practice or just give me the perfect herbs and give me the diet. I'll follow it. It's really like from moment to moment, are you living in connection to your truth? Mm. And that's deep spiritual work. And that's not maybe where we start. But ultimately, when we think about balancing our hormones or treating something like ADHD, for me, that's what it comes down to. That's so beautiful. So beautiful. And I think that's the work we don't want to do, right? That's the hard work is to really look at our perception and our beliefs. I can recognize this with a lot of my clients and probably even myself that I'm out here in this world on my own without support. I got to get it done. If I don't do it, nobody else is going to take care of me. You know, that whole belief structure around the the weight of my life rests on my shoulders. Mm -hmm. And You know, I think we're not meant to do this healing work alone. Some of this stuff is just too big for us to heal on our own. And I think there's so much power in community. And so in my work, I'm moving away from just offering one-on-one stuff because I'm realizing just the transformative power of community. And so because of that, I'm starting to develop group programs and group courses because like you said, this work, it's too big to handle on our own. And so I think being in community, it helps us sort of move through all of us and we can hold different parts of it. And this is not something that we can take on all by ourselves. You know, I think that goes back to the indigenous cultures and colonialism and how therapy, especially in the Western world, has been influenced by capitalism and colonialism. And, you know, this idea that you're just going to come in here, sit in front of me and do it on your own. It's not the nature of being human. We are supposed to be in communities, healing and grieving and supporting and nourishing one another. So tell me what your community might look like that you're building. I'm just curious. Yeah. So I'm developing a group 
program that will be launched in the fall around ADHD and hormones. It's about connection. It's about education, I think, is a big part of it. A lot of the things we've discussed today for the sake of empowerment and validation so that, you know, diagnoses absolutely can be helpful, empowering. And I love what we do, Amy, because we get to offer also a different way of thinking about or relating to a diagnosis. So, you know, of course, I'm coming from a yoga therapy and Ayurvedic perspective, but education around this stuff. And then we'll sort of like go into each phase of the cycle a little bit like we did today. We'll really get into practices that can nurture and support you throughout those phases. And again, we're also individualized. So what works for someone is not going to work for another person. And so to create a container where folks can try on different practices and then have space and support to sort of process and integrate what worked and what didn't work and to hopefully feel empowered to then take on what works. So that's sort of the hope and the intention, but a lot of connection and ritual. I think we've lost ritual. So bringing ritual into healing and deep connection I want to back it up. I mean, you're talking about the interventions, but I think there's so much healing and coming together and realizing you're not alone and that other people have also been dealing with these exact same problems, like the acknowledgement and the being seen by other humans that have gone through what you've gone through. That might be the most healing part. And not to say that all the interventions and yoga and herbs aren't fantastic, right? But I just think, especially as women, it's just not talked about. I know when I got my period, it wasn't really talked about. And then when I start going through perimenopause, I'm like, what the hell is happening to me? My brain that I've depended on for 47 years and has always been sharp and willing to work with me is gone. And nobody had told me this might come. So I think that's a feeling part of what you're doing is to help women just be with other women and realize they're not alone. Absolutely. Because I think what you're describing is brief, yeah. right? And briefs is one of those things we cannot hold. We can't hold that all along. Absolutely. And I tell that to my group that I run. It's like, yeah, you're getting all these awesome tools and you're learning all these amazing, you know, research back interventions. Just like you said, the most important thing that's happening is that you're realizing you're not alone and you're connecting with other peers you have the opportunity to feel seen and heard as you are. And that's it right there. It's way less about the interventions. I think it's much more about the connection and the support and the community. Yeah. And I know you're doing this for ADHDers, but I'm guessing you might even have some shoot off groups one day of women going through perimenopause. Maybe that's another group that forms or postmenopausal. And maybe you'll even have classes for young women who are getting their period for the first time. I'm here mapping out your future for you, (laughs) whether you want it or not. And you didn't ask, I know, but I'm just imagining all these different life stages and the joy that happens in each one of those stages, but the grieving, I mean, it's different at each time that our hormones change, new things come up and you're like, what the heck is this? What is going on with my neck? What is going on? You know, whatever it might be, the thickness of my skin. I don't know. I have a good group of women around me that we're always talking about this stuff and laughing about it, frankly, but I think a lot of women don't have that. Yeah. And I think that hopefully what that also helps us access sort of the gifts of each of those stages, right? Like Mm -hmm. the menopause is really when we enter our wisdom years. And if we're just in the throes of the symptoms of the discomfort of it, we lose that. So I think absolutely to all of that, I want to support us at all of the stages. (laughs) I just just create a bhavana for you, whether you want it or not. (laughs) Yeah. Gosh. Well, there's one more thing I want to ask you about, and it's kind of a little bit of a left turn because we were coming to a nice closure, but I'm just so curious about this. So I want to throw it out there. You said that you'd like to share about panchakarma. So first of all, we have to define what panchakarma is and how it impacted your ADHD, maybe even premenstrual. I don't know if you had PMDD, but like, how did that panchakarma impact you? Yeah, thanks for asking that. So as you know, I said it many times here. I'm, you know, when I went off Adderall, I was working with a therapist. I had done a lot of incredible work with therapy. I love therapy, huge proponent of therapy. I think what we offer is a beautiful complement to therapy. So I was lucky enough to have a yoga therapist and an Ayurvedic practitioner. When I went off my Adderall and I stopped drinking, 
Mm -hmm. So I'm over a year now alcohol free and removing substances, which also for folks with ADHD, we have one in four of us are in recovery. I imagine those numbers are low because you can imagine the last two weeks of the cycle, as I said, our dopamine goes down, our serotonin goes down. It makes sense that one would want to reach for substances to sort of self-soothe. So once I removed substances and again, I've done all this work with yoga therapy and Ayurveda, I really got to realize how my mood was cyclical. I was never formally diagnosed with PMDD, but quite sure that I meet the criteria. So I had done all this work, but I was still sort of like, even with the herbs and even with a lot of the practices that I was doing, there were still some struggles with my digestion and some difficult periods. Like, so things like clotting and pain and definitely mood stuff. And so I had given myself permission, like one full day of rest. I was okay with that. But anyway, I had the opportunity to travel to India, do a 26 day Panchakarma treatment. And so Panchakarma is an Ayurvedic, I think it's even considered like a surgery. That's sort of like language that they use, but it's a really powerful Ayurvedic intervention. Do you want to add anything to that? I don't know if I'm describing yeah, Panchakarma well, right. I would just say that for a month, you got to take extreme amounts of rest, but you probably also ate a very clean diet. You probably got massages with different herbal concoctions, and they probably did give you some spiritual therapy also in terms of your perception and looking at it from the deeper angles. I mean, it's kind of like you could think of it as a cleanse, but it's also restoration, right? Yeah. That is exactly what it was. So we ate at the same time every day. And again, despite me knowing this, Amy, I know we're supposed to eat. Like I know that was the first time <laughs> I've ever done that. <laughs> and I was Doing like, it is a whole other thing. It was, that was one of the most mind blowing things or takeaways from that is like eating at the same time every day is so powerful for my digestion and my nervous system. So we ate at the same time every day, super nourishing, easy to digest Indian food and lots of body work, lots and lots of body work. So like warm oil being poured in a rhythmic way over your body with herbs specifically for you. There was did, you have, did you have more than one person massaging you at a time? I did. I did. And, and I think people think, oh, that sounds so amazing. I have to tell you, if you do it every day, you can get very sore to have multiple people doing really deep tissue work day after day. I don't know how you dealt with it, Maya, but my experience was like after day three or four, I'm like, I don't want any more massage. It hurts. <laughs> did you have that experience? No, you know, this was really gentle. Mm. Like everything in this Panchakarma experience was really gentle. I would say the uncomfortable part about it was I had never felt that relaxed in my life. Mm -hmm. And that level of quiet and relaxation was a bit unfamiliar and uncomfortable, but also really beautiful. Yeah. And, you know, they chant and, you know, pray over you before these treatments. You know, I was living in a very tiny town in India where, you know, all there is to do is go hang out at the temple or sit by the river. Yeah. So people might be wondering once you get there, and I know getting to India is super expensive, but once you get there, it isn't that expensive, is it? You don't have to say a number, but... Yeah, I was shocked. It was like a quarter of what I thought it would cost. I was shocked at how little it was, but I think there's definitely a range. I mean, I was not at like a fancy spa by any means. This was like, you can go to spa like places and I'm sure pay 10 times what I paid, but you know, this was a small family run ashram and there was no fancy bells and whistles about it. It was not a spa by any means. If you go to India, it's obviously much cheaper than doing anything here. Yeah. So that brings me to closing up of today. You and a good friend of yours, Heather Fontenant, you're going to be doing a yoga retreat in the mountains of Western North Carolina in September. The place is called Mount Mitchell Eco Retreat. Tell us about that. What are you and Heather going to bring forward in this retreat? Oh, we're so excited. Yeah, we're doing a retreat on the fall equinox at this beautiful retreat center right in the mountains. Everybody will have their own room. There's a deck outside with rocking chairs outside of every room that just overlooks the mountains. Heather and I have both trained with Amy, so Krishnamacharya Vini Yoga. So we're really bringing trauma to this. Like from the moment folks arrive, we're so excited to just wrap our arms around everyone and make everyone feel really nurtured and cared for. But yeah, you're going to get Krishnamacharya Vini Yoga morning and night, there's going to be meditation, self-inquiry, 
opportunities to really deeply connect to workshops on Ayurveda. I'm doing Anjali's bodywork intensive this summer. I'm mm-hmm. getting trained in Ayurvedic bodywork. So I'm excited to walk that, teach both ways that they can bring in bodywork into their life, but mostly lots of connection, lots of nature, lots of rest, and like really beautiful yoga practices that come from Wow. From, from Amy. <laughs> <laughs> well, not from me, from my yeah. teacher. But. From your teacher, right. Gosh, that just sounds divine, especially on the fall equinox. Right. That's- We're having a private chef cooking Ayurvedic meals. So you're just going to be like fully pampered and nurtured. And we would love to have anybody who resonates with, of course. So Maya, where can they find out more about this retreat? I know that your new website is coming soon and i think it will be released by the time that this podcast is released that is www.mayasiemens.com and i'll put that in the show notes is that where they could see more about this retreat yeah you can register for the retreat all the information will be on my website heather will have it on her website as well and you can just get on my mailing list i'm imagining by the time this podcast is out we will have already launch the retreat. Even if you're not wanting to come to this retreat, feel free to just put your email in my website. I have a free downloadable Ayurvedic and yoga period guide with recipes and practices and Mm. herbal tea blends. So you can go grab that. And I have a free spring workshop coming up in the spring and the hormones and ADHD course coming in the fall. So if you just want to stay in touch and be a part of any of that, yeah, just head to my website, sign up for that put your email in there and would love to be connected. Maya, I'm so happy for you finding your purpose, the meaning, the way that you're going to share with the world. I know that you have really, really studied yourself and the people that you want to serve so, so deeply. And it's, it's really beautiful to see it come into the, the blossom that it is. So thank you so much for doing this work on yourself and now letting it flow into the world. It's pretty inspiring. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for providing me the space to do this work. Mm. Thank you to Maya for educating us today and just being present with us and offering so many wonderful solutions for the problems that we're suffering from. I am so happy to see women in the world like Maya, like Claudia Welch, Anjali Deva, so many others doing this wonderful work. And as I said, I think everybody all over the whole world, young women, young men, we need to learn all about this. One other thing I wanted to share with you, I have a friend and colleague named Ray, and she told me about this book called Decolonizing Trauma Work, Indigenous Stories and Strategies by Renee, L-I-N-K-L-A-T-E-R, And this book is mind-blowing. It's really talking about how our current system of helping people to deal with trauma may be a mismatch. And I kind of alluded to it in the podcast, but healing traditionally was not done all by yourself. You had a community, you got to grieve together, you were able to be seen, be heard, be felt, you were able to connect with others who were also having those same losses, and that that is how we heal from trauma. And there's so much more in this book. My mind is blown. I think everyone needs to read this book. And the way that it relates to our conversation today goes back to this kind of new trend that I'm seeing in yoga and yoga therapy that we're starting to want to have these communities and these healing groups. I know my Monday night yoga therapy clinic is packed. It's an online yoga therapy clinic And I am overjoyed with how many people want to come together on Monday nights for about an hour and a half and really heal, do this deep healing work together. So I'm seeing this trend with our Optimal State students, but many other communities out there are doing it too, where people are deciding that healing happens in community. It doesn't happen as well individually. Not that we can't do our individual work too. So I just wanted to say that, you know, I was making a yoga nidra tape last night for an individual 
who is healing with herself, but also within a larger community. And it was really beautiful to create a yoga ninja tape that could include both of those aspects. How do I do my own internal work that needs to be done? But how can I also connect to a community that's all of those people are also doing their internal work and then we come together and share. So that was a really fun yoga nidra to create along these same lines that we've been talking about today. So I hope some of you will join Maya with her community that she's creating and maybe even go on that retreat. That sounds divine. So thanks for listening. It's been a pleasure to be with you all and we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Yoga Therapy Hour each week. We're building a community here, and we'd love to hear your ideas about how you would like to build more community with us. Feel free to email us at welcome at theoptimalstate.com and give us your ideas on ways that we could be of service to you and build more community. We'd love to hear from you. Again, welcome at the optimal state. All right. Have a great day. We'll see you soon. A special thank you to our team here at Optimal State. We are truly a global family. George Mantuan, one of our executive producers. Adam Satchel, senior media producer and sound engineer from the Philippines. Krishna Panchal, a producer from Canada. Modupe Abdullahi, who does the show notes and is an editor for us from Nigeria and Peter Morley who wrote and produced the music for this show who lives in Australia find more about Peter's work at www.zenmusic.biz thank you for listening we'll see you next time